Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer, and I'm your host, Walla Blagay. And today we have a special guest, Professor Susan Carl from American University Washington College of Law. And we're honored to talk with her today about her new book, Defining the Struggle, National Organizing for Racial Justice, 1880 to 1915. And this book focuses on the early civil rights movement. This is the late 1800s to early 1900s and some of its leaders, which segue into important organizations such as the NAACP and also the 1950s, 1960s civil rights movement, which we all know very much about. So we're gonna talk about the book today and Professor Carl, tell us a little more about you, yourself. Well, thank you so much for having me, Walla. This is really a great treat, and I'm really happy to be here. I am a law professor, as you know, um, and I have a background in community organizing and uh, racial justice issues, and uh, I practiced for a while as a labor lawyer and for a while as a civil rights lawyer. Um, so my research interests are connected to my background and my former practice uh, areas, and I um, started to write this book. I worked on a different article and on the early NAACP, and I started noticing that the ideas that the early NAACP had when it was founded, which was in 1910, so it's a very old organization itself, but I noticed that the uh, ideas about sponsoring test cases and using an organization to bring lawsuits and then also using a lawsuit to build an organization that all those ideas were already very well formed in 1910 when the NAACP was founded. Mm -hmm. And I started wondering where the ideas had actually come from. And you often hear the story as if the NAACP just sort of invented these ideas suddenly, you know, out of people's heads. Mm -hmm. But really there's a much longer history to the ideas. And I started just sort of not planning to write a book necessarily, but just for my own interest, I started really trying to dig down and make the connections between earlier organizations and what happened in the 20th century. And over time, as I did more and more research, I realized that I should write it up as a book. And so I ended up writing this book. It took 12 years, but it's finished now. <laughs> wow, well, it is a very great book. I read it myself, a very quick read, very interesting. So set the stage, what's going on, Who? what is the, what is the background? What it, what's going on in the late 1800s, early 1900s? Yes, well, the, so the, um, really the history of organizing on racial justice issues goes back to the beginning of the country, as we all right. know. And um, I decided to start this book at a, a crucial, what, what I thought was a really crucial change period, which was after the end of Reconstruction, uh, when the federal troops had pulled out of the South and where the nation's sort of race relations was going down. And uh, historians call this the Nader period, meaning it was a period of the worst uh, race situation in the United States since the end of slavery. And there are many terrible things happening, lynchings, uh, race-based violence, labor violence, um, the passage of all kinds of statutes that enco encoded in law, racial inferiority. Uh, this is the period in which um, the uh, Jim Crow uh, transportation segregation became really entrenched. Mm -hmm. um, schools were inferior, segregated. Uh, opportunities for African Americans in the economic sphere were declining, jobs were being closed to African Americans. So it was a really terrible time in the nation's history. Um, and it was at this period of time that uh, civil rights organizers decided that instead of having sort of episodic or every now and then and regional organizations or state-based organizations, that it really was important to bring together a national umbrella organization. And there were a number of different organizations, a number of attempts at organizing this kind of permanent infrastructure right. to really coordinate um, civil rights activities around the country. So that, to me, that was an important um, sort of turning point. And I start the book right at that period around in the 1870s when these first ideas for national organizing were getting started in the face of these terribly uh, atrocious declining conditions. Interesting. Now we do note that um, Prince George's County is a great place for 
Howard, Howard University alumni. Yes. Many, many, yes. many of the constituents here are Howard. Absolutely. Alumni. So I think that they would be very happy to hear that some of the leaders were very much of Howard alumni themselves or even involved right here in D.C., in Washington, D.C. area. Oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the story um, focuses on Washington, D.C. for a number of reasons, and you're right. First of all, Howard University, and especially Howard University Law School, was the training ground for these early civil rights lawyers. And John Mercer Langston had founded the law school at Howard University. Uh, he had been involved in the Freedmen's Bureau, and after Reconstruction, he was assigned to set up a law school at Howard, and he did, and he was a prolific writer and lecturer, and we have his uh, writings and his lectures so we can see what he was saying to people, how he was training them, and he was very focused on civil rights, and he really believed that it was the part of the mission of the graduates of Howard Law School to go out to make a living to do business law and all kinds of different kinds of law, but also to always remember their responsibility to fight for civil rights. And so he was sort of that, that kind of really inspirational leader. And um, most of the leaders that I talk about in this book who, are, who were lawyers uh, graduated from Howard uh, University Law School. And later on, we can talk specifically about who and when and that kind of thing. But it was a very, very important um, uh, conduit to civil rights organizing for lawyers. Uh, and Washington, D.C. also was very, very important for a lot of reasons. First of all, there were a lot of professionals in Washington, D.C. Um, who were involved in the civil rights struggle. Um, many of them had federal government jobs. Um, and so they were able to watch what was happening nationally. And one thing that uh, historians haven't spent a lot of time talking about but is very important was that this early civil rights organizing, there were lawsuits involved and there were test case lawsuits, but as important were efforts on, about national legislation. Mm -hmm. And in the states, there was also a lot of work and some of it very successful in getting civil rights statutes passed or improving the civil rights statutes that already existed um, for the reconstruction period. But at the national level, of course, things were going in the wrong direction. And so a lot of the effort was focused on watching what was happening in Congress. Mm -hmm. And people who were um, worked in the federal civil service were well situated to be keeping their eyes on the situation and working mm -hmm. uh, to lobby the, uh, you know, at the federal level. So DC was really a, a centerpiece of a lot of important activities. Some of the most important meetings of the organizations I discussed in the book took place in DC and it was really um, a very, it was an intellectually very vibrant place where ideas were being passed around about how do we put together this effort, this national effort. What is it going to look like? What are the priorities? And of course, in the period I'm talking about, none of those, we take it for granted because we know the model that the NAACP later adopted. And we just think, oh, of course, that's, but at earlier, none of those ideas were taken for granted at all. They were all being debated. People didn't know, should we do it this way or that way? And all of those discussions were taking place really in many parts of the country, but probably most uh, important was DC. Interesting. Well, you talk about these organizations. So now, tell us what these or who are these organizations? Well, there were the, the organizations that I focus on, and I, you know, I picked and chose what I tried to do. I was trying to trace the transmission of ideas. So the organizations that I chose to focus on in various chapters of the book were the organizations where I could trace the leaders of those organizations moving into other organizations and transmitting their ideas through time to a younger generation of activists. And the organizations that I talk about are the National Afro-American League, which was founded in the 1870s by T. Thomas Fortune, very important activist who's trained at Howard Law School and lived in DC for a while, mm -hmm. uh, then moved to New York City. He was from Florida originally. Um, the National Afro-American Council, was, it was also a, a heavily DC based, and we can talk more about that later. Uh, and that organization was founded in uh, the 1890s and it was in existence until around 1910 mm -hmm. when it basically got absorbed into the NAA, early NAACP. The National Association of Colored Women, mm -hmm. the NACW, which was um, an organization that early historians used to say, well, they just were doing charity work. 
but in fact they were also building the infrastructure for a social welfare and you know, economic empowerment. And they were also very important politically in understanding the early um, racial justice organizing, national racial justice organizing effort. Um, now, is that, that, is that organization connected with the National Council of Negro Women? That was later. Okay. Uh, and the NACW actually still does exist, but it, you know, it's not, not in nearly the same form as it did back then. But this was before the National Council of Negro Women uh, so it's a precursor organization. Um, and, that, and the NACW was founded by Mary Church Terrell, who of course is a DC native. Uh, well, she grew up um, in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, but uh, she settled in DC and married uh, Robert uh, Terrell, who was the first municipal, uh, African-American municipal court judge in the country. Uh, they were a dynamic duo of uh, political power organizers. Couple. They were the power couple, they really were. <laughs> And also, sort of the social, the social couple and the power couple. So she was based here, um, and that's another organization um, that I focus on in the book. Uh, I focus on the Niagara Movement, which was founded by W. E. B. Du Bois and also some other uh, important uh, leaders. And that was really the, the 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 central precursor to the NAACP. That really the NAACP platform is borrowed directly from the Niagara Movement. Um, and then I talk about how all of these organizations, their ideas, their leaders, their strategies, their organizational design all flowed into establishing the NAACP and also the National Urban League, which were founded basically right around the same time. And they mm -hmm. kind of took on this project and propelled it into the um, early 20th century. Um, and I know we're going to circle back on this issue a little later, but how does this these movements and these different organizations segue into the the civil rights movement that we witnessed and we yes. benefit from. Yes. That's a complicated question. Mm. Because there's a lot, you know, there's a there's a it's a long the the, the century is long um, and there are various stages in it. And so the sort of popular conception sort of has this again the civil rights movement just sort of arising in the 40s and 50s just from nowhere. Mm -hmm. But really, a lot of the very important um, early initiatives of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks refusing to sit in the sacred, those are things that had been happening a century before. There were hundreds of cases that had ha already happened. And then something about the zeitgeist of that period just it's, you know, ignited in the national consciousness. And then you have you know, the mass-based movement. And historians, um, you know, they quibble about, can you call anything that was happening before the 1930s, for example, is that a movement? Because it wasn't really, doesn't meet the technical definition of a social movement, which is, you know, mass-based and successful. <laughs> and a lot of what these early organizations and leaders were doing, uh, were, it was a you know, smaller set of people and they, they didn't have success for a long, long time. All but, right, we're going to yeah. come back and talk a little bit more about the segue to the civil rights movement that we all know of and also more about the different organizations. Stay with us. As a parent, I know one of the most important times to be with your children is when they aren't feeling well. For many families, there's a place they can go to find the support they need. Ronald McDonald House Charities programs provide that supportive environment so families can be together while their children are dealing with serious illnesses. You can volunteer your time at a local Ronald McDonald House or drop your change in an RMHC canister. Today is a great day for all of us to show our support. To find out how you can get involved in your community, visit rmhc.org. There are some things in life you can control, and this booklet can help. From keeping your family healthy to saving for retirement, order your free copy now from the American Diabetes Association, because we want everyone to be healthy and happy. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer, and I'm your host, Walla Blagay, and we're talking with Professor Susan Carl about her book, Defining the Struggle. And we're gonna go into the actual organizations that were involved during the time period. So let's start with, um, maybe we can start with uh, the Thomas Fortune Group. Absolutely. So that was the National Afro-American League. Okay. And what, there's so many things that are interesting about this organization. Um, it was really the 
Fortune's vision for this organization, when you see him write down the organizing platform, mm -hmm. and what he wanted to do with it, and how he wanted to organize it, is so close to the organizing vision for the NAACP that it's almost shocking or you know, wow. really very surprising. Interesting. Um, he didn't have the resources to make the organization work in a long-term right. way, but he had the vision. So he really, to me, was the visionary. Mm -hmm. um, and he foresaw having a national organization with state chapters, all of them working on their own particular issues, that would come together for an annual convention once a year to share so ideas. Familiar. Yes, exactly. <laughs> to share ideas and to debate strategy and that kind of thing. Um, he also, um, this was a period where all of the many, many issues involved with racial justice, to fortune they were all related and he wanted this organization to do it all. Um, so he wanted to work on economic advancement. He wanted to work on social issues. He wanted to work on political reform. And he also wanted to do test cases. And of course, he had been trained at uh, Howard's Law School. So he's very, he didn't actually graduate, so he wasn't technically a lawyer. Was he but a journalist, right? He was a journalist. He wrote, he had a very important uh, newspaper that, you know, the, um, that had various names, but is generally known as The Age, the Afro-American Age, the New York Age. Um, and this was probably the best national, organ, you know, national newspaper, and many, many people read it, and so he could use that as a platform to articulate his ideas. And he solicited other people writing letters to debate what the organization should look like. But he really had the idea that, and it wasn't that he thought test cases would win. Would win. He didn't think that they would actually achieve change, um, necessarily, but he thought that they were a good organizing vehicle. So he had very modern views about how to use law to build organizations and to bring attention. He really wanted to bring worldwide attention to the problems of racial injustice in the United States. Now explain test cases just for those that are listening. Now test case means you go and find a way to, to litigate? Yeah, so you know, one way, sort of the traditional way of thinking about lawyering is you wait for a client to walk in the office, you find out what their issue is, you think about what you can do for the client, you take on the case and you litigate the case. But a test case really is one where you start with the issue, you start with a principle that you want to test or um, fight about in court. Mm -hmm. And then you look around to find a plaintiff, a person who might have a grievance or a cause of action to pursue that principle, that legal issue. So you're sort of really trying to pick the, uh, you're trying to maximize the resources of an organization by picking the cases that will have the most bang for the buck, so to speak. So, and that sort of, now people have been doing that, of course, for many years, but the idea of building an organization to do that and using that in the civil rights arena, that was something that a number of people were talking about, but Fortune picked up on that dialogue about that, and there. Actually, there was a, a Maryland organization called the Brotherhood of, uh, for, of Liberty that was Baltimore-based that was doing test cases even earlier. And so Fortune heard about the, the people who were doing that work and, um, and started to uh, um, argue that this would be a good thing for an organization to do. Now, this is important because one of the important, let's, let's connect that with the NAACP. Yes, okay, now, yes. What do they do? How do they do? Do they do test cases now? Or? Well, yes, I think they're doing a lot of things now. They're doing a lot of work on health care policy because the issues in, at this stage in the 21st century have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And some of the issues that, the, um, that Fortune wanted to take on way back in 1880 have been solved. Some of the formal equality issues that being formal under the eyes of the law, mm -hmm. at least on paper, those issues have been solved because of the civil rights movement, the long civil rights movement through the 20th century. But many other issues, including things like economic justice, economic equality, um, social welfare rights, all of those kinds of things, and by that I mean rights to education and housing and all of those things that you need in order to support a flourishing human being. Those were all issues that Fortune deeply believed in, um, and those issues have not been solved. So I think the NAACP today is focusing on some of those issues at this point, as well as uh, continuing criminal justice, injustice issues, and I mean, all those things that come along. 
But so there's sort of this uh, interesting story of some things that have been very, that are long-standing uh, uh, threads that are very continuous, and some that have come and gone over time depending on what the priorities are. But it's amazing to see how much of that agenda Fortune had already articulated in 1880. Interesting. Well, let's talk about the Niagara Movement. Yes, well, the Niagara Movement, um, so there's, you start with the Afro-American League. It, it has a fairly successful, um, about five years of uh, existence at the national level and local organizations lasted longer, but then it declines because it, it just run, Fortune runs out of funds. Right. Um, and that's replaced by a more conservative organization called the Afro-American Council. Okay. And the Afro-American Council, an, an, another leader, uh, Bishop Alexander Walters from the AME Zion Church is really the visionary leader of that organization. And he has a different model. So he believes in a more pragmatic model. And what he wants to do is have an umbrella organization that unites all the leaders, all the main leader, national leaders, even though they have very different underlying political philosophies and other philosophies. So everybody's part of the Afro-American Council. And Booker T. Washington is there, and Du Bois is there, mm -hmm. and they don't get along. And they're the people who kind of subscribe to their two viewpoints are really at odds with each other for okay. a number of reasons. What are their viewpoints? Well, so in many ways, they're actually more similar than you know uh, history has told the story, but in other ways not. Um, Washington is very cautious, very careful. Um, he is secretly funding test case litigation. So it's not that he doesn't understand how complex the civil rights struggle is, but he doesn't want people to know what he's doing. He, especially white America, he does not want, he's also a great fundraiser. He's raising you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to fund um, various higher education institutions from white philanthropists. So he has to have a very, very conservative outward appearance, though we know he actually was not a conservative in all ways. Mm -hmm. um, and he also wants to make sure that he's in charge, that he runs things, that he controls the doors of political access to jobs and that kind of thing. Um, Booker T. Um, uh, W.E. Du Bois, on the other hand, he is kind of a militant right out there on the surface. And he wants to oh. demand rights, and he wants to to shame white America, and he wants to fight, and he wants to stand up for what's right and true. He wants to have a democratic organization, and he's also on economic issues much more sort of progressive or radical in this time period, and of course later he becomes a socialist and then a communist, but in this time period he's already very progressive on economic issues. Uh, Book, uh, du Bois wants to work with the labor movement. Washington is very anti-labor. And he, so there are many, many differences in philosophy between the two figures. And they start to really, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of infighting within the Afro-American Council because of these differences. And eventually, Du Bois decides he cannot work within the Afro-American Council and a number of other very important leaders as well um, come to this conclusion and they break away and become the Niagara Movement. So the Niagara Movement is an explicitly anti-Washington, more militant organization than the Afro-American Council. In your book, you do discuss what some of the leaders thought of Booker T. Washington. And this is you know, not just W.E.B. D. Du Bois, but some others. And what, yes. what, was, what was the rumors? What, what did people think of him? Well, different people had different views about him. And many people got along with him just fine. So somebody like Robert Terrell, for example, he liked Washington and Washington liked him. And of course, Washington was very important to one's career right. because he was very close to a number of presidents. He was close to Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he was able to get people federal jobs, right? And so it was important to stay on Washington's good side. So there were the, that group of people. And then there were people who didn't like him and thought that he was holding back the effort. Um, in part because they didn't know, because he was very secretive about all of the work that he was doing. He didn't let people know that, even within the Afro-American Council. He didn't let people know that he was funding these uh, test cases. Okay. Um, so there were some people who really didn't like him. And then there were people who, who really agreed with him and who were also on the more conservative end of the political spectrum. So there was a wide variety of views about him. But one of the points I make in the book was, 
it was really a brave act to join the Niagara movement because it could have meant the end of your career. And many people who did join the Niagara movement really did face terrible repercussions from uh, opposing Washington publicly. And Washington had people, you know, he had spies who would report about what people were doing. So it was a very brave act, and it was just one of many, many brave acts that, um, you know, happened in the course of the long civil rights movement. Interesting. Now, how did the Ni Niagara movement sort of segue into the NAACP? Yes. Well, it's, and I think this has not been um, discussed nearly enough in the historical literature. What happened was, again, it was very hard to have resources uh, for the Niagara movement. And uh, Booker T. Washington really controlled access to most of the big funds. Uh, and he was able to draw them into his, his work, his organizing work. But the Niagara movement really struggled with that. And at a certain point, uh, du, uh, du Bois got together with some white progressives, race progressives, who were becoming more and more concerned about what was happening racially in the country. Right. There was the Springfield, Illinois riot in um, 1908, um, which was, of course, the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln. And there was terrible race violence there. And so these sort of newcomers, these white newcomers, who weren't experts in racial justice organizing at all, but they had a lot of political and social con connections, and they could, had access to funds. They sort of um, allied with Du Bois, mm -hmm. and they formed an organizing committee. And they started to organize a structure for the NAACP as a biracial organization. And Du Bois, at a certain point, writes in the newsletter of the Niagara Movement, or the newspaper, called The Horizon. And he says, you know, we need to engage in coalition politics here. Mm. Which was, of course, something that the young T. Thomas Fortune also had been saying a long time ago. Okay. And we need to kind of ally with these um, other well-meaning folks and establish a new organization. And he provided the membership list and all of that from the Niagara movement. So the Niagara, the NAA, early NAACP really is the Niagara movement reborn. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for oh, this, this great is... review of this book. It was too short. We're going to have to have you come back. Oh, anytime. I'd and love to. If somebody wants to get the book, how do they get the book? Uh, well, you can organize it from, uh, or, or order it, <laughs> organize it. <laughs> Got organizing on my mind. You can order it online. Um, Busboys and Poets has a very good uh, site. You can uh, just Google defining uh, the struggle, um, and my webpage, the book's webpage, will come up, and there's a link right there, and you can uh, order it from Busboys and Poets. Uh, or get it anywhere else online. And, and can you get it on Amazon? Oh, absolutely. You can get it on right. Amazon. Though I'm trying to avoid Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Try to support the little guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go ahead and order the book, please. It is a great read. And thank you for joining us. I've been on the street for a while. I've been on the street for a while. I've been on the street for a while. I saw your poster outside. I saw your poster outside. I ran away from home. I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. National Runaway Switchboard, how can I help? Call 1-800-RUNAWAY to make the connection.